we've been doing these overviews of the various letters written by the Apostle Paul. And all of the previous letters that we've looked at so far, uh, and we've covered most of them at this point, have been written to churches, all writing to the church in Corinth, or a group of churches, like the, the letter to the Galatians, or the letter to those four churches in Galatia. The three remaining letters that we still need to look at are written to individuals, not to whole congregations, but to individuals, uh, to Titus and Timothy. One to Titus, two to Timothy. And today, we're going to be looking at this letter to Titus. Last week uh, was kind of an interruption in a sense. Uh, we weren't looking at a letter last week when I was here. Uh, we were looking at uh, the evidences, the reasons to think that Paul must have been free from that first imprisonment in Rome, when he was held in house arrest. Uh, some of the factors from that being some things Paul says in Titus, and says in 1 Timothy, and says in 2 Timothy, that, uh, that indicate to me that uh, those letters just don't fit before Paul's third journey uh, when he went to Rome. Not third journey, his journey to Rome. Uh, he had his first journey, his second journey, his third journey, during which time most of those letters were written. Then he's arrested in Jerusalem. Uh, he's put on a boat, taken to Rome. You remember some of the events from that journey. They tried to stop at Crete. It didn't work. The storm caught them up. They're out at sea, just being battered by the waves. They have shipwreck at the island of Malta right over here, and finally get to Rome a few months later. Um, and in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, Paul says, For this reason I left you in Crete. So we know that at some point, Paul had to have been on the island of Crete with Titus, and then Paul leaves and leaves Titus there. Because he writes, For this reason I left you in Crete. Um, and as far as before Paul's house arrest in Rome, this is the only time that Paul was near the island of Crete, at least that we're able to learn about. And Titus is not traveling with him at uh, this time. And Paul probably doesn't even go ashore because he's being held prisoner on that ship. Uh, so that's one of the reasons, one of the reasons, I uh, believe that uh, this event when, that Paul speaks of here, leaving Titus on the island of Crete, must have happened uh, after Paul was freed from that Roman house arrest, he was able to go out and travel and preach again in various places, uh, Crete being one of them. So, uh, who was Titus? Who was he? Titus was apparently a, well, he was certainly a Gentile convert. Uh, Paul mentions in Galatians chapter 2, verse 3, but not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. That's a reference to uh, really the first time we run into Titus, as a matter of fact, um, that, that event we read of in Acts chapter 15, when Judaizing teachers went up to Antioch, and Paul and Barnabas and certain others, Luke tells us there in Acts chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas and certain others go from Antioch down to Jerusalem, talk with the, the brethren in Jerusalem about that issue, and I believe he, Paul is writing about that same incident here in Galatians chapter 2, when he says, not even Titus who was with me was compelled to be circumcised. But the point I'm making right now at the moment is that he was a Greek. He was born to Gentile parents. That makes him a Gentile. Um, and this is his first appearance when uh, Paul takes him, as well as Barnabas and some others, to Jerusalem. And that might indicate that Titus was from Antioch. There was a, a growing and thriving church there. Um, and it may be that that's where Titus was 
converted, that that was where he was from. We do know that Titus worked with Paul on his third journey. You remember the third journey when, uh, we'll use this map just a little, oh, I'm going to ask you that when you go back to it. The third journey when Paul leaves Antioch and he comes over here to Ephesus and he's there in Ephesus for two and a half to three years. Um, during that time that he is in Ephesus, I'm turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he sends Titus over to Corinth. So Titus had been with him in Ephesus. Paul sends him over to Corinth, and he mentions this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18. I urged Titus to go and sent the brother with him. I'm not sure who that brother is, but anyway. Titus did not take any advantage of you, did he? Did, he not, uh, did we not conduct ourselves in the same spirit and walk in the same steps? Um, of course, there are problems in Corinth. And, but Paul reminds the Corinthians, look, I sent Titus to you, and he was good to you. He didn't take advantage of you. Uh, and it may be that, that Titus was the one on this occasion that Paul sent him to Corinth, uh, that it may be that Titus was carrying that first letter to Corinth, 1 Corinthians. Uh, at any rate, somewhere in that general time frame, Paul did send Titus to Corinth, uh, as mentioned here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18. And also we read in, in Paul's letters, uh, well, in 2 Corinthians, about how he had, again, I need to go back to that map. Uh, wrong direction. Give me a preview of stuff I don't want you to see yet. I don't want people to get previews. Um, so Paul's here in Ephesus. Here's the Corinthian church. Paul has sent Titus over there. And Paul doesn't know yet how did the church in Corinth respond to 1 Corinthians. And Paul is so eager to find out, but he doesn't want to get to Corinth until he finds out. He wants to find out how they responded first. And so instead of going directly to Corinth, he travels up this way, and he's hoping to run into Titus, who's coming up this way. And so he says, we read in 2 Corinthians, and now I'm going to go back to our question, who is Titus? That's what we're talking about. So he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, when he finally does write the second letter, he describes how eager he was to find Titus, to find out how the Corinthians had responded to the first letter, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. But when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, he left Ephesus, went north to Troas. When I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, not finding Titus, my brother. But taking leave of them, those people in Troas, I went on to Macedonia. Now Paul kind of leaves that thought there and then picks it back up in chapter 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 5 through 7. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 5. For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side, conflicts without, and fears within. But God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus. So finally, up there in Macedonia, Paul runs into Titus. He's able to get news. How did the church in Corinth respond to my first letter? And so Paul continues <coughs> writing here, verse 7, and not of comfort, not only by his comfort, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted in you, as he reported to us your longing, your, uh, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice even more. And then finally down in verse 13, for this reason we have been comforted besides our comfort, we rejoiced even more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit had been refreshed by you all. So that's a little information about Titus. He's a Gentile converted to Christ might have been from Antioch, but we do know that he went with Paul to Jerusalem on that journey to straighten out the mess in connection with those Judaizing teachers. And then we find Titus with Paul 
in Ephesus on Paul's third journey. Paul sends him over to Corinth, and then they both travel north. Paul from Ephesus, well, I'll, I'll do this for your reading this direction. Paul from Ephesus, Titus from Corinth, up, and they meet in Macedonia, and Paul's finally able to get the news from Titus how the Corinthians had received his first letter. Now, though, it is several years later, and uh, it is after Paul, at the end, you know, it's after the, the third journey, Paul gets arrested in Jerusalem, he's held prisoner two years, then he's sent to Rome, where he sits for at least another two years, and it's after all of that, and Paul is now again traveling and preaching, that Titus is with Paul on the island of Crete, and it's after that, that Paul, probably shortly after that, that Paul writes a letter to Titus saying, for this reason I left you in Crete, that you might set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. So, Paul has left Titus there, and the first topic Paul talks about in this letter to Titus, probably not long after he left <laughs> Titus there, was telling Titus, set in order what remains to be done, to establish elders in every city. Obviously, that means every city where there are brethren, where there is a church, uh, but to establish elders in those churches. And we're not going to look at these qualifications in detail. In fact, we're not going to look at most of them at all. But one of the qualifications, the last one that Paul mentions, chapter 1, verse 9, that the men chosen to serve as elders, verse 9, should be holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, that he may be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. It is so important for elders to have the knowledge necessary to hold the word fast enough in their hearts that they are able to exhort in sound doctrine and be able to refute those who contradict. Those men need to be knowledgeable. Why? Why is that so important? Why do they need to hold the word so closely in their hearts to have such thorough knowledge of the word? Well, because of verses 10 and 11. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced. It's the elder's job <coughs> to silence men like that. So yes, they need to exhort in town doctrine. They need to be encouragers. But they also need to be capable of refuting men like this. There are men like this, rebellious men, verse 10, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not, for the sake of sordid gain. So there's a problem in the, on the island of Crete, and this problem kind of exists everywhere, but especially on the island of Crete. Um, rebellious men, empty talkers, deceivers. And he says, especially those of the circumcision. Not only those of the circumcision, but especially those of the so. You have some of these Gentiles who are like this. You have some of the Jews who are like this. And uh, Paul says those, those men chosen to be elders need to be able to deal with this because the people on the island of Crete have a big problem. Paul quotes a Greek poet to Titus to illustrate the problem of the people living on the island of Crete. Verse 12. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said. So this, this poet, this prophet, was a native of the island of Crete. He was a well-known writer in the ancient world. And Paul was familiar with this quote of his. And the quote is from this, this poet, this prophet. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Boy, that's quite an indictment of the people of an island. <laughs> the 
Paul quotes that after saying there are many rebellious men who need to be silenced. As one of themselves said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. So that's a problem. When you're working with brethren who are coming out of this culture of the island of Crete, they're still living on the island of Crete, but this is where they grew up, this is where they developed habits, this is where they developed ways of thinking, ways of living, and they've lived among and probably participated in being liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And that problem has infected the churches. Because, you know, you bring people out of a society, they're going to bring their habits with them. And they have to learn, like Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, be transformed by the renewing of the gospel. Don't be conformed to the ways of the world that you've grown up in. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And so that's what needs to happen with these brethren. But it never happens instantly with everybody or with anybody. And so this problem infects the churches there. And uh, so that's why Paul says you need to choose some elders who are ready to deal with these rebellious people. And then he goes ahead to say, after he quotes that poet in, in verse 12, Paul goes ahead to say in verse 13, this testimony is for true. He quotes the poet about liars, lazy beasts, of uh, evil beasts, lazy buttons, and then he says, that testimony is true. For this cause, reprove them severely that they may be sound in the faith, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. There were a lot of Jewish ideas about what had happened in the past in the Old Testament times and what that meant for, for them in this period. There were a lot of Jewish myths about uh, some New Testament things as well. Uh, and Paul says, no, they don't need to be paying attention to those things. Teach them not to pay attention to those things. But also, commandments of men who turn away from the truth. Men have always wanted to add to what God says. Men have always looked at God, looked at the Bible, and seen what the Bible teach, teaches, and then add some other rules. And you have to do this, and you can't do that. And Paul says, teach them not to pay attention to those commandments of men. So, Continuing with what Paul says, as far as these rebellious people, uh, even among the brethren, who need to be taught better, in verse 15, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient, and worthless for any good deed. You, you might argue that Paul is just talking about people outside the church here. But as I read the context that leads up to this, about the rebellious people that the elders need to be able to deal with, I think he's talking about some people in the churches as well. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient. And that's why they need to learn to be better. Okay. Well, I think that the rest of this letter should be understood with this problem in mind. That Cretans are just, for whatever reason, especially evil. And so that brings, when you convert Cretans, because nobody changes completely and instantly, that brings problems among the brethren. And so there needs to be teaching within the churches about being fully transformed. And so, as we'll see here in chapter 2, uh, Paul tells Titus how he should teach the various segments of the churches, the various segments of brethren within the churches, divided by age and gender, as he does here 
in the first several verses of chapter 2. Uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Paul talks of and tells Titus how to teach the older men. Titus chapter 2, verse 1. But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in the faith, in love, in perseverance. Now that's that's a lot different than uh, evil beasts, lazy gluttons, and liars, isn't it? But that's the challenge. That's what Titus needs to be teaching these older men. Here's the kind of person all the older men in the church need to be. They need to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in the faith, in love, in perseverance. Much better people than they have been. Much better people than the average Cretan was. He turns his attention to the older women in chapter 2, verse 3. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, not enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. And particularly, he says in the next verse, that they may encourage the young women love their husbands, and so on. So he talks about what the older women need to be like. You know, the older women have also grown up and in this Cretan society where people are liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. And that has affected them, just like that society affected the men. But they need to be better than that, just like the men do. And so let them be reverent in their behavior, not gossips not enslaved much wine, teaching what's good, and helping the younger women. He turns, Paul turns his attention to what Titus needs to be teaching the younger women um, as it follows directly from his discussion about the older women. The older women who, verse uh, 4, uh, I'm sorry, where's my verse? Um, yeah, verse 4, that the older women may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be dishonored. So that's the kind of people the younger women need to learn to be, to be transformed by the renewing of their minds, and to be these kind of good people. And then briefly, uh, Paul mentions the younger men uh, in verse 5, likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. Sometimes that's one of the most important things young men need to hear. Be sensible. And that's the one thing that, that Paul mentions to Titus about what he should be teaching the younger men. Next, Paul speaks to Titus and says, you who are there on the island of Crete, working with these churches on the island of Crete, you make sure that you're a good example to them. Verse 6, uh, rather verse 7. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine, dignified, sound in speech which is beyond reproach, in order that the opponent may be put to, to shame having nothing bad to say about us. It won't do any good for Titus to go to, to go to all of the brethren there in the various cities on the island of Crete and tell them to be good if Titus himself is not setting a good example. And so Paul, you know, after telling Titus you need to teach the older men this, the older women that, the younger women this, the older the younger men this, says, and you, make sure that you are a good example of good deeds, pure in your doctrine, righteous and dignified, and so on. Well, why all of this? Well, because that's what Christians ought to do, right? But Paul gives some specifics about that. Chapter 2, verse 11, through the end of this chapter, 
for the grace of God has appeared. When you see that for, that's like because. This is the reason we all need to be good and transformed by the gospel. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present <coughs> age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of, the, of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem, that he might redeem us from every lawless <laughs> deed and purify us for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. That's why they need to change. That's why they need to make sure they've been transformed the, the, themselves by the renewing of their minds, why they leave the customs of Crete behind, the ways of living that this poet characterizes them as being liars, evil beasts, ways of gluttony, to leave all of that kind of bad behavior behind uh, because God has saved them. And we're looking forward to being with him. He redeemed us from every lawless deed so that he can purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds, not the deeds of the creatures. Well, there is this phrase repeated five times in chapters two and three, good deeds. Remember, we're kind of thinking back to this, this problem on the island of Crete, that the people there are so bad in so many ways, and there's this emphasis in chapters 2 and 3 now on good deed. We find it in several verses here. Chapter 2, verse 7. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds. In verse 14 of chapter 2, that Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem for us, uh, redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Good deeds in verse 7. Good deeds in verse 14. Then chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. Then in chapter 3, verse 8. This is a, this is a trustworthy uh, statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who believe God may be careful to engage in good deeds. Finally, in chapter 3, verse 14, let our people also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs that they may not be unfruitful. This emphasis on good deeds definitely flows out of this problem from chapter 1 of people who are evil, they are rebellious people, they are the people described by that Greek poet, uh, and they are described in the last verse of chapter 1 as the opposite of good deeds. The last verse of chapter 1, chapter 1 verse 16, they profess to know God, but by their uh, deeds, by their deeds, they denied him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. And that's where this starts about good deeds. That those rebellious people that really <coughs> need to be worked on in the churches on the island of Crete, they're worthless for any good deed. And they need to learn to be better than that. And that's the reason for the emphasis on good deeds in chapters 2 and 3. So, the first occasion of good deeds, aside from the end of chapter 1 where he says these people are worthless for the good deeds, the first instance of good deeds in chapter 2 is where Paul says to Titus, you make sure you're a good example. Verse 7, in all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds. We need to be good. Titus needed to be good. And you can't be good 
unless you're doing good things. I mean, what's, how do we understand the concept of, I'm good, I'm a good person. What good deeds have you done lately? Well, I don't know, I haven't really done anything. Then are you really good? Titus needed to make sure he was an example of good deeds. You need to do good things. Then in the end of chapter 2, uh, that we're looking to be with the Lord. The Lord is looking to have us for himself. And this last verse of chapter 1, that Christ gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Not just that you begrudgingly do some good things now and then, but you're zealous for good deeds. There are things that you've learned you're capable of doing, good things you're capable of doing. Not everybody is really good at all the good things. Um, some people are good at these good things. Some people are good at those good things. You know, Paul says we all have a different gift. But there are good things that you can do. There are good things that I can do, and we need to be zealous about those things. Not just, oh, well, I'm, yeah, okay, I should do that. I guess I'll do that. The Bible tells me I need to be zealous for good deeds. Develop that within yourself. Because we're looking to be with the Lord. The Lord is looking for us to be the special people. The third time we read about these good deeds is at the beginning of chapter 3, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. Now, there are, there are some things I don't think I'm the best at. There are probably some things you think you're not the best at. There are some other things that I think, you know, I think I'm pretty good at those things. But that doesn't mean that the things that we think we're good at are the only things we should ever be doing. And these other good things, well, I never have to do any of that because that's not my specialty. No, we need to be ready for, for all of them. It's just there may be an emphasis in your life that I realize I've got a gift for these things in my life. Some other people may have gifts for other things in their life. And so focus on those. But be ready, chapter 3, verse 1, for every good deed. Chapter 3, verse 8. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a trust, trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who believe God may be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. Be careful to engage in good deeds. Don't just, you know, if, if a good deed happens to show, if potential for a good deed happens to show up, okay, yeah, I'll kind of I'll, I'll do that. Be on the lookout for those things. And when you see the opportunity, then do it with care and diligence. Be careful to engage in good deeds because they are good and profitable for people, Paul says at the end of verse 8. And then finally, verse 14, chapter 3, verse 14. And let our people also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs, that they may not be unfruitful. There are needs around us that you can help fill. They are pressing needs that are around us that you can fill. Good deeds meet pressing needs. And that's how we're fruitful. When we take the opportunity to do good things because they meet pressing needs. And so Paul finishes this letter. And our culture here may not be as bad as the culture at Crete was, such that a person who is Cretan himself said that Cretans are liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Maybe our culture is not as bad as Crete was. But, you know, we have in our culture some of the same problems 
that are in even a more evil culture, even if we maybe have them to a lesser degree. So this letter to Titus is a good letter for us as well to think about the things and the emphasis and the themes of this letter. And I hope that's helpful to you this morning and as you go through your days. In a moment, we're going to stand and sing our song of invitation. And if you realize that you need to be doing things better than you're doing, your life needs to be different, and there's maybe sin than in your life, you need the prayers of this congregation. We ask you to come as we stand and sing. In the desert of sorrow and sin, 